Hello, everyone. Welcome back to the Divine Feminine Healers Podcast. I am honored, overjoyed, so excited to have Dr. Claudia Welch back on the podcast again for another episode. I'm just so excited for this conversation. Thank you so much for your time and for being here. It's it's my real pleasure. Thanks for pro providing a space for doing this and thanks everybody for being here. Something that I ask everyone who comes on the podcast because it's called Divine Feminine. I love hearing how the Divine Feminine expresses herself through each person. So I'd love to hear how do you connect with the Divine Feminine and how do you feel like that energy expresses through you? Mm. It's such a beautiful question, and I I love being asked different questions that I'm off than I'm often asked, and and I don't get asked that very often. So thanks for the beautiful question. I um, it's interesting when I tune in to the thing that I need to tune into at every moment of my life that I don't always, but when I remember to tune into something, the thing that I need to tune into is my innermost essence and i'm never i'm never sort of analyzing that like which part of that is the feminine and which part of that is the masculine what's the mother what's the father what's the sister what's the brother it doesn't feel like it has those attributes to me it feels my innermost essence feels like essence mm. and essence feels non-dual to me and so i don't spend time in my personal practice and my personal life trying to touch the feminine trying to um tune in to the divine mother that the divine feminine i try i'm just looking to tune into that essence however so that's really, I mean, that's really true for me. And when I'm really connecting to another person, whether I'm tuning into you or even to the listeners that I can't see or to my husband or to my nieces or my nephews, I'm not trying to tune into their masculine aspects or their feminine aspects. I'm trying to tune in trying to see their essence, their innermost essence. And to me, that doesn't feel, that innermost essence in them or myself doesn't feel dual. It doesn't feel like I could even put a spotlight on the masculine or feminine of that essence. So I don't feel like I'm trying to, in my life, tune into the feminine. That's not to say that it doesn't um, manifest in some ways. Like I think while, while I'm not looking for that, a great part of my professional life and um, Grahasta, the second stage of life, the householder stage of life, has, has almost accidentally feeling been, um, been very much connected to the feminine in terms of manifested physical feminine um women's health right women's health is a big part of what i've done and so most of when i teach most of the people i'm teaching when i was in practice most of the people i was working with were women by far and away the the bigger percentage and there's something amazing that happens Every woman knows this. There's something amazing that happens in a room full of women. There's something great also that can happen in a room with co-edness, right? Um, and, you know, with this, I haven't had enough um, groups of women that include trans women, that include non-binary people that are identifying themselves in that way. So while while it's um while that while it's very likely that trans women and um uh other and non-binary people like there's certainly a magic that can happen everywhere but in the rooms that i've been in where 
at least what I'm seeing and people are identifying themselves as women, there's, there's an incredible thing that happens. And it is different than when there's men present. Um, and I think that in a way we are tuning into something, some aspect of the divine feminine that, uh, that everyone can tune into, not only if they're um, cis women, but also if they're trans women, non-binary non or men, everybody could tune into that aspect if they allow, if they don't impose themselves on the space. You know, a, a group of women changes if one man walks in. It just does, right? And a lot of women, most women will will know this, right? You're nodding your head. Do you, have you had that experience? For sure. I mean, I'm even just thinking of my parents, you know, and they have very much your typical, my dad is very masculine energy and my mom is very much feminine energy. And just, it's so interesting, even just when they walk in a room, like you said, like, you know, even as a kid, you know, when my dad's there, it's like, sit up straight behave and then when my mom's there there's this kind of softness and there's this kind of ease and flow that i kind of feel so for sure yeah i think it's not a it's not certainly not a secret for women it might be a little bit more mysterious for men because as soon as they walk in the room the energy changes so they don't see how it was often there are those men like in my life who are more like girlfriends than male friends because they they can drop right into that space really easily. And so I think I think there's that is how I experience the divine feminine in in a, in a conscious way that I, I'm not trying. I'm not looking for the for the divine feminine in that group of women. It just happens and it's so receptive it's um there's less there's less kind of ego dominant games um that kind of stuff in general i'm certainly painting with a broad brush here but it's very it's often very inclusive it's often very accepting it's often um in these in these spaces that uh that i've been in you know, at a seminar or something like that, you know, certainly women can be catty and judgmental and we can, you know, we can be, we can be ambitious, we can be competitive, all of those things. But it, in, there's a lot of spaces that I've been in um, where we're looking at where, where it's a safe space and what happens with that energy with women does feel like divine feminine. So I would say that that's a way that I have touched it and tuned into it that I haven't even tried. It's just, it's just happened, but it's wonderful. It's really wonderful. Yeah. I, I love that so much. How first it relates to your personal practice. I agree. Um, if I'm in meditation, I'm not in particular, even reaching out to a certain deity necessarily, unless there's a specific ceremony I'm doing, it's just turning into that divine essence. And that's enough. That's, that's plenty for me to absorb and to, um, get my fill that I need and my connection to source. And I, I have a, I have a community of women and it's, it's something really special that happens when women come together. And I don't know if it's because we've, at least in this short time, have gotten away from that. And when women are together, it's just like, oh, it's so powerful. And it's something that has been missed for a while that it just feels like home. And there's these deep bonds and connections, but it's also and deny that when the divine masculine is all together too that there's its own power and force that can happen as well it's just um something again like you said it just happens something we've been drawn to i i too have been drawn to women helping women heal with their hormones and just gathering together a community of women that just seems to be this kind of um part of my dharmic path and it's beautiful to see it all play out like that yeah, it is. And, you know, I'm remembering this, I think it was like a, a uh, it was some performance that I went to see that had co-ed performances and 
um, and there were there was a lot of different drumming things going on, and there was this one. I'm, I, you know, honestly, I can't remember. I was I was thinking of this as a drumming thing, but I'm also remembering this dance performance, similar thing where there was co-ed dancers in a bunch of different performances, and then one with just men. And the whole energy when it was just men changed and it was electrifying and the, both for the drumming and the dancing ones that just came into my head. And it was absolutely mesmerizing. So it's not to say that women may have something together that that may not that be quite as accessible to men. It's not to say that it's better. It's just different. And when I see this whole group of men doing something together it can be so powerful too and and then when i get to so in the groups it becomes really obvious to me with individuals it's again kind of it's kind of interesting going into that essence and connecting in the essence all of that falls away and i mean all of that is not just um it doesn't feel like that powerful, wonderful thing that happens with women and that powerful, wonderful thing that happens with men. That doesn't feel wrong. It doesn't feel divisive. It just feels like what is. But it's so interesting that even all of those wonderful aspects fall away when I'm connecting one on one with a person, essence to essence. And that's such an interesting thing that we might belong to a biological group, a species group, a, a gender group that we identify with or whatever. But all of that falls away when it's one to one. I'm not sure I've ever quite thought of it that way before, but do you know what I mean? Definitely. And it makes me think of just identities in general and how we, it's like, we have all these language for things like the doshas, for example, in Ayurveda, and it's so important to kind of hone in and get really specific. But then at a certain point, at what time does that become that we don't need to segment all of these things anymore? And what are we truly getting at is that essence and just owning the truth of it all but behind the mask, behind the identity. And actually, one of my questions that I had for you, because a lot of women in my community are going through these transitions, specifically in their dharma, where what used to really light them up in their dharma, it needs to evolve. Maybe there's more offerings that they're wanting to expand into. And at times this feels very difficult because the identity of just a healer or, and then moving to a teacher or something as simple as that, but it feels very, it's like a death that happens. That's really hard to let go of. And so I'm curious what you have experienced with your own identity shifts and making these transitions what is that process like like how can we find ease and grace through that process it's a brilliant question and you're touching on something that i've noticed a lot for decades in uh, you know in in working with this stuff which is that the word dharma that you used and i forget how you put it but something like their dharma is evolving i don't believe that for me, that's not the way Dharma works. Dharma doesn't evolve. Dharma is the abil my ability to access and live up to that innermost essence. That's bus. That's it. You know, that is what it is. It's not, you know, when somebody says, oh, it's my Dharma to be a healer, I don't really relate to that because what if someday you're, you're not, you're not, you don't work in private practice. You don't work in that way. You do something else. Does that mean your Dharma has changed? I think that means your karma has changed, your actions. Karma means action. Your actions have changed, but the Dharma being that ability to tune into the innermost essence at any moment and the courage to live up to that, what you, what, what I find there, that's my dharma. And that's why I can't ch choose my dharma. I can only choose to live in accordance with it or not. I can't choose what's, what my innermost essence is. I can only tune into it. And what I find there, I can act in accordance with that. And that takes courage. So the choice is not what dharma do I choose? The choice is, do I will I have the courage to live in alignment with this innermost essence or not? The actions will change minute to minute. The words will change minute to minute as the minute is requires, as that innermost essence requires 
at that moment. So what's changing is not the Dharma. What's changing is the actions and the, um, the commitment to the innermost essence is hopefully galvanizing and strengthening, solidifying and becoming easier to access. So, and, and, and I'm more and more trusting of that as time progresses that this action might look crazy, it might look incongruous, it might look consistent, it might look inconsistent, it doesn't matter. What matters is it consistent with my innermost essence. So the action can change, the Dharma doesn't. So how does that deal with identity? How does that work with identity? Anything, identity is such an interesting thing, right? The word that we use in Sankhya philosophy, which we accept in Ayurveda and so many other um, Vedic vidyas, sciences, um, or kalas, arts, or teachers, texts, traditions of India, the ahankar that we all, you know, every, every, so many, so many systems accept Sankhya philosophy. In Sankhya philosophy, ahankar is the aspect of the self that's like between the higher self and the lower self, the higher self being merging more and more with oneness and unity and the lower self meaning identifying more and more with variety and difference through the five sense organs um, and our interaction with sensory objects so we start to identify not with oneness but we start to identify with differences i am this i i am separate from you i am in this country which is separate from your country i am doing this thing i am eating this thing i'm smelling this thing i'm tasting this thing i'm feeling this thing all all these things that we do in the ways that we interact in the world we begin to identify with and our focus goes out to those things and where our focus goes our ahankar follows our prana follows and our ahankar immediately our our eye former our ego our identity wraps around that and it's incredibly tenacious and subtle and almost instantaneous process there's a a study that I, I have mentioned many times, and I, I should probably figure out where it's from, but it goes something like this. They, they have, and you have to use your imagination for this, but imagine there's a table with a tablecloth on it, and your arm is in a certain position under the tablecloth, so you can't see your own arm. It's in a certain position. Somebody puts on top of the table where you can see it, a prosthetic arm, like it's made out of rubber or plastic or something. And they put it in the same position that your arm, that your invisible arm is in, your real arm. They lay that on top of the table. Got that idea? Mm -hmm. Okay, so what happens? What happens is after a few minutes of looking at that prosthetic arm, if they run a feather down that arm, I feel that my arm has a feather run down it. Mm. So this piece of plastic, this prosthetic limb that I have had no emotional or physical connection to, no history with, no relationship to previously, I now have it completely adopted as me. That's how fast the ahankar works. That's how fast the identity works. When we focus on something, even something we have zero connection with, we make it we we make it our own very quickly. So it's very easy to identify with what we're doing. So an identity crisis is when we we can't help it we identify with what we focus on. So if I'm focusing on you, I'm becoming you to a small degree. And, and they know with mirror neurons that this happens. If we focus on each other, certain neurons in our own brains start to fire that, that are firing in the brains of the people we're focusing on. We start to become each other very quickly. We start to identify with each other very quickly to one degree or another, depending on a number of factors, including how focused we are on that person or that thing. So 
a crisis is if we have been focusing on something externally, something that we do, some a relationship that we're in, an idea we have about ourselves. If we've been focusing on that for a long time, that is very tightly woven into our ahankar, into our identity. If that thing that we're doing, relationship we're in, whatever, X, Y, Z, changes, that feels like we're threatened. Uh, you know, we lose a job. We feel like we're threatened, like we've got a, a knife in our back, you know, or in our gut. We've, and nobody's doing it. We're healthy. We're likely to survive. We're likely to find another job. We're, we're alive. We are safe. We are not being bombed. Why do we feel that we are being threatened? Because that identification process, there is a death. We are. Uh, the idea of who we are, which is pretty inseparable uh, um, from our feelings of who we are, is being threatened. So it is like we have a, a knife in our gut, right? And so that's the whole thing with meditation. That's the whole thing with uh, a spiritual practice is to, is to spend time every day as much as we can, bringing our, our attention and our focus, diverting it from outward to inward to identify with that innermost essence we've been talking about that I feel is dharma that innermost essence that I feel is the divine feminine, is the divine masculine, that doesn't change. Karma changes, focus changes, that innermost essence doesn't. And that's where, if we're focusing there, that doesn't change. There's no identity crisis to be had because that won't change. So having that connection beyond gender, beyond um, uh, identification with outward stuff, that's the stuff that protects us from those kinds of crises in my experience and understanding. I love that. And I feel like that mirrors Ayurveda so much because Ayurveda is so much practicality in it. And so if we were to mirror that too, we're in transition right now, going into Vata season, the most transitionary time of the year as we also go on to Navatri and darkness into, or light into darkness. And it's really interesting that Ayurveda has Dinacharya and what grounds you, what is stable. These are routines that do not change, although nature is changing all around us. And of course we adjust our routines to that, but ultimately these practices serve as that backbone and it helps to strengthen, like you said, that essence within us so that when things start to, identity starts to shift and what our seemingly reality um, which is really just Maya, the illusion starts to really change, but at the heart of it, what is still true for, for all of us and all of that is, it's just so profound. It just honestly always blows me away how Ayurveda just always gets at the heart of it. And I've been thinking a lot. I brought this up in a lot of podcasts last year of there's so many different dynamics dynamics to yoga and Ayurveda and how it's constantly evolving and dancing. And when we talk about the ancient texts, though, what's so beautiful, like taking the yoga sutras, for example, you know, that was so relevant 5,000 years ago or even plus, and it's even more relevant right now. It's so amazing to me to think of it that way. And then it has me wanting to contemplate that with Ayurveda. And sometimes I, I wonder and I pause because Ayurveda can be so specific. And I wonder, but what parts and principles of Ayurveda can we learn to dance with that are still going to hold true given this relative times? Because it's the same with all the Vedas. That's how brilliant it is. It's no matter what time and place we are in, it's still going to be relevant. So do you see any aspects of Ayurveda um, because they are so specific, do you see us having to see them in a different way, given our modern context? And which principles do you see um, just really being that solid foundation? Yeah, so um, in brief, you're looking at what stays the same and what's different in Ayurveda, if I got that right. Yes. Um, since you said that you've been looking at this for a while, I'm curious before I blab about this, what you've been finding, what have you been finding is, 
is the same and what and what dances what moves and what stays still yeah so i i've been finding that it may hold true at certain points in my life but i find that what changes is my connection with it so i had to almost you know i i I learned Ayurveda from a very traditional and classical way, and I had to kind of step back and learn to see what my body was really telling me. And I realized even though the ancient texts were saying something, um, eating specific diets for Pitta Dosha, which is a dosha that I can relate to a lot and have imbalances, a tendency towards, um, but they weren't working in my body at that time. And that's not to say that if you have a Pitta imbalance that they weren't working, but it was just relative to what I was experiencing at that time, for example, or all these lifestyle practices. I used to have a four hour morning routine and that just was not sustainable. And my body just didn't want that anymore. So I had to learn to dance with them. And that's not to say that those practices wouldn't provide stability for someone else, but they weren't right for me in that time. So it's almost like, I feel like my relationship to it is the thing that starts to change and evolve. It's really beautiful and it's sort of the macrocosm of what we were just talking about if the microcosm of the innermost essence stays the same and the karmas, the actions change around it. It's the same thing in a way in the, in the macrocosm of Ayurveda in exactly what you just said, the, that the principles remain the same. Your, our, my understanding of those principles becomes refined over time. And I learn better how to, how and when to apply those principles. So, um, and this is one of the principles of Ayurveda. I believe it's in Sushruta Sanghita. Sushruta says, you know, if you have, an, if you have a principle, no matter how sound it seems to be, if you look in yourself and it doesn't work for you, then you absolutely have to throw the principle away and look at what is real for you. Uh, you know, I forget how, you know, exactly, I'm paraphrasing, obviously, but that's, that's it. You know, so in a way, to me, and I'm making this up at the moment, maybe I'll feel differently tomorrow, but to me, the, the, what Ayurveda is, the whole thing is developing awareness of of reality and so if we're going to elaborate on that the reality of relationship how what happens to me in this situation what happens to me in this moment what happens to me when i eat this food how do i feel how do i feel in this moment where is the prana stuck in this moment where is the heat where is the erratic movement? Where is the stuckness? What can I do to cool that heat down, warm that cold spot up? Um, what can I do to remove obstructions from free flowing vayu, free flowing prana? What can I do to move obstructions? How can I breathe to do that? How can I be in relationship to do that? How can I move my body to do that? How can I eat my lunch to do that? It is, a, it is so it's this choice for awareness, awareness of reality, awareness of the reality of relationship between my organism and my environment. What is, how am I going to affect it? How is it going to affect me? How can I cooperate with that in such a way that reality is unobstructive, uh, unobstructed, that prana is unobstructed, that flow is unobstructed, that digestion is unobstructed, that stability is unobstructed, that these primal experiences are allowed to be without being obstructed. So all of that to bringing it back to just what is Ayurveda is it's choosing to live in awareness. And so when we're living in awareness, it's that living in that dedication to awareness of the internal terrain that is stable. Everything else is mobile all the time. And so um, my relationship to everything else, refining my relationship to um, 
of that reality with my innermost essence, with my awareness, with my inner terrain. I love that so much because I think that's often the most misconstrued aspect of Ayurveda is that it teaches you embodiment, to live in body, to validate your experiences through body, to source your power from within. And I think that we, and I, I'm talking from my own experience, I, I have seen others fall to this, is you can source your power into something that seems outside of yourself of, oh, this Ayurveda says, do this, don't do that. There's this right and wrong, which, you know, we can link back to kind of like this patriarchy, um, misogyny, colonialistic society that we kind of have and how there has to be a right and a wrong type of thing happening here. And it's it's really not saying that, it's missing the point. And I think that's when people miss the boat of understanding Ayurveda, that it's not telling you what diet to eat and what not to eat. It's telling you to validate it through your own body experiences, just as the Vedas say in yoga. This means absolutely nothing if you cannot validate it through your own direct experience um, that they use that that language, direct experience. How are you interacting with the divine? Do these practices work for you? And that's been so much my journey of in this moment, reconnecting back to Ayurveda and realizing this sense of embodiment that has brought. It's just, it's, it's mind blowing to come to that and to really source your power from within. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. Sourcing the power from within. And it's interesting, like how, you know, one of the questions is here is like, how, um, from a certain perspective, how do we know what we know? How do we know Ayurveda is real? How do we know this model of reality is real? How do we know anything is real? How do we know anything? Mm -hmm. And Ayurveda accepts three, sometimes four valid forms of, of knowledge. And one is <clears throat> Opta, which is testimony of like the 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 authorities, like the the sages and the books written by the sages, like the you know the the different texts that we rely on these ancient texts. That's one form of knowledge, and you know that is an imperfect form because times change, interpretations change, translations are faulty, and so forth. But that is one place we can look. And another uh, valid form of knowledge is inference, which really is a fancy word for guess. <laughs> you know, we're we're guessing using using some kind of information. We're guessing what must have happened to this person in the past to bring them here where they are, for example, if we're seeing a patient. And if I see certain things going on with you right now, what does that mean that is going on internally, right? I can use sort of present inference and I can always also use inference for the future. Okay, this is what you've been doing. These are your actions now. Where are you likely to go and end up if you continue doing that, this beautiful role of holistic medicine, right, is interrupting a trajectory that doesn't look so good, making little tweaks, right? So that's a valid form. And then the other one is pratyaksha, observation. And often this is taken as you observe something out there with your own eyes, and therefore you know it is real, and that is knowledge. But I think a, a more... Um, subtle way of understanding that and a powerful way of understanding that is pratyaksha, inner pratyaksha, uh, turning that gaze inwardly. Uh, pratyaksha is perception, right? So perceiving what's going on in our own bodies. That is a valid form of knowledge. And that is a very powerful one. So yes, we have the texts that we can look to as a valid form of knowledge, but direct perception ourselves internally looking inside that is a valid form of knowledge even according to ayurveda right yeah and i i was reading your article um i think it was about a year or so ago you posted an article about ayurveda and culture appropriation and i was really looking for um a leader in that space to really dive into this because i was questioning that a lot and I think this kind of interplays with this conversation and you may have even brought these uh, definitions and topics into that article of what really signifies us as finding truth and integrity when we're sharing Ayurveda. And it's, it's almost like I felt like I was dancing a really fine line of, I want to have my unique relationship with Ayurveda to express that with others, to inspire them and to also connect them to this beautiful science 
but also I know I'm walking a fine line because I want to honor the ancient lineage. I want to honor the traditions that where it came from. And, and it was kind of this balancing act here. And you brought up such great checkpoints. I actually made sure I implemented them within my programs and with my offerings with my clients to be sure that we are in integrity. And yeah, I guess I'm just curious on, we, we're always dancing with these topics. So I'm curious, what are your current thoughts on a cultural appropriation in Ayurveda? Oh yeah, that's really good question. Well, uh, for the listeners, please read that article. Maybe you could post a link to that article because I don't want to just regurgitate what that article said. But I've been thinking about that a, a little bit more. Like, you know, I take my cues very much from my guru, and my guru was born into the into the Sikh religion. He um, entered into a spiritual path that is not identified as Sikhism. Um, and he, my guru, my spiritual guru was also a Vaidya. So my spiritual guru was born into a Sikh religion, practiced this other more esoteric um, tradition in, in, within this other lineage. And his, his teacher for Ayurveda was a Muslim gentleman. So it's interesting, you know, India has a very... Um, uh, it's uh, like did did, did you, if it has a very inclusive tradition you know within other, there may be certain lines that don't feel inclusive that are exclusive and specifically say no nobody besides our family is going to know is going to learn this this um, material my guru was was very happy that i was studying ayurveda and he never talked about cultural appropriation. What he, and and so it's interesting because okay, I'm taking my cues from him, but I've had to use inference, one of the valid forms of knowledge, to infer why he didn't talk about this specifically, why he was okay with me doing this, and in terms of how he taught me, what was he emphasizing that is important in this question of cultural appropriation and so if i taking if i'm taking my cues from this and looking at it the fact that he thought it was fine that i was doing it that's important the fact that um he was seek learn from a muslim teacher uh a, something that um many consider a hindu related subject that tells me something. The main thing, I think, for me personally that I come away with from this is what did he emphasize? He emphasized weeding out our flaws. He, he emphasized uh, purity in thought, word, and deed, and weeding out rajas and tamas in the mind. Every night, you know, he would say, do a diary, look at your thoughts, words, and deeds in these different categories that are very similar to the yamas and niyamas. Um, so what, where, where was the greed? Where was the anger? Where was the attachment? Where was the violence in thought, word, or deed? Where, where, where was that? And I think when we get into, when I look at that, what, what feels like getting into cultural appropriation territory that is damaging is when I'm using, when I am engaging with this material from a place of greed, mm -hmm. from a place of clutching, from a place of attachment, that it's not, it's not that I'm in, the problem is not that I'm engaging with this material. The problem is when I engage with this material for greed or for some other um, purpose besides being in alignment with my innermost essence and uh, and interacting with reality minute by minute as it comes to me. So if at some point all of my interaction Ayurvedic in the in Ayurvedic world and with Ayurvedic other Ayurvedic students besides myself and the community, if that all went away, I would have to be fine with that. I would have to be fine with that because that's reality. 
But reality is bringing that right in front of my face, moment to moment to moment. So how am I interacting with that reality? Am I clutching? Am I trying to take more than I need from it? Am I trying to project something that's unreal about myself onto the canvas of social media, right? Am I, what am I doing with that that is not in integrity? That becomes problematic, whether we call that cultural appropriation um, because it's damaging, that ends up having a damaging effect on Ayurveda, on the culture that it came from, et cetera, or whether for one reason or another, that's going to be damaging, whether we call it cultural appropriation or whatever we call it, that's going to be where the damage comes in. So th those are my, those are my thoughts about it now. Thanks for asking. And thanks for paying attention. I think this is an important conversation, you know, um, we need to be having, you know, all, all of us, whether we're in India or not in India, you know, um, whatever whatever culture we we come from, say, okay, well, wh what is my relationship to this? Do I feel like, uh, yeah, and self introspect about this? Yeah, thank you so much, and I'll definitely link the article here because you have such clear checkpoints where everyone can really understand how they can connect with this beautiful science in a really authentic way. And some of the points that I just want to highlight is knowing lineage of where your teacher is coming from is super important. And I think that comes up a lot in question, at least my community members are always asking me where I received my education and where to come from. And that's such a great question. And then something that also really stood out for me was that consistent self inquiry in which you're expressing of, this is what it is and what it means right now, but where are my thoughts? Where are the gunas of the mind later on? You know, have I got, have I lost the plot? Have I gotten too far away from it? Am I disconnected from my actual dharma, dharmic intention for this? Um, it, it's something really great to ponder. And yeah, I thank you for that clarity. I think that there was a lot of um, confusion and there still kind of is in, in the scene here. And it, it's so needed, you know, this Ayurvedic science is so needed for those who are ready to step up. And I think that already healers can want to hide, want to not show their gifts, want to not express due to their own fears that they have. And um, it's really important to get behind these topics and understand the meaning behind all of them. I I had one more question that it's kind of- To the best can. Yes. Um, I, had, I had one more question and it's more so um, kind of on the basics and I get this question so much in my community and I, I've honestly been questioning it myself too is um, it's always a confusion between Prakruti, the constitution and Vikruti, the current imbalance and I mean one of the most common things that I always get in my community for those who are just beginners in Ayurveda is what is my dosha, how do I know what my imbalance is and everyone always asks me, can your constitution change? And I was always taught, you know, no, that's just like your natal birth chart. It's always the same. And then I kind of questioned it once I, the only time I questioned it actually was when a mother went through birth and she felt different. She felt like she was in a new body. And she said that I feel like my constitution has shifted. And I, I've been pondering that ever since. And I'm wondering if it's because when we go through these transitions of life, we go through the kappa, the pitta, and the vata phase, if that has any, anything to do with it. But I'm curious if you noticed the, the transition into being a mother, if that can ever shift the constitution, or if, if any externalities can shift the constitution, or is it just our perception of all the other doshas that are at play at that time? Yeah, it's a really good question. Thank you. Um, so the first thing I would say is that we start getting confused if we think that the, the model of Prakriti and Vikriti is reality and don't see it for what it is, which is an imperfect model of reality. So it's, and if we get too constricted around this is the reality how can i make my experience conform to the reality it's it's not going to be all that elegant it's not going to be as fluid as reality itself so the general model is saying in general you're going to have a you know a property that is pretty stable throughout your life there's going to be a lot of changes that happen to it 
there, you know, there's Deha Prakriti and Dosha Prakriti and Janma Prakriti and these other terms that I don't really want to go into right now, in part because, um, because I've heard them talked about in different ways. So if you get too, too constricted around what are the different kinds of um, Prakriti and what do they mean, I mean, you, you, you get behind one teacher's definition of that and, and dialogue around that, and then you read something else somewhere, then that's going to confuse even more. But there are these ideas that, um, that Vikriti can encroach on Prakriti so much that it feels like the, the Prakriti changes, that the current condition can become so powerful and so long lasting that it feels like it has this Prakriti level, like permanent level change. Um, certainly what I've, se I've seen women feel like they're in entire new, entirely new bodies after they've given birth, also after menopause, whole different, different scene. Also before menarch and after menarch, right? Uh, I mean, talk about, it's unbelievable what happens at menarch. It's unbelievable what happens at menopause incredible what's happening at menopause the entire endocrine system arguably the most deep powerful influential system of the body is reorganizing i mean you are a different person on the other end of that you know one way i like to think of that is you know in chinese medicine they say that women's physiology is rooted in blood and men's physiology is rooted in chi which is to say prana well from a certain perspective if we're looking at that we could say that a woman's physiology before menopause is rooted in blood and after menopause is rooted in chi in prana mm -hmm. so there's this whole change of physiology yes you are different it's a different system um does that mean your property is different it you can't answer that because property isn't reality it's a model of reality right so you could say that some things about your constitution are the same and some things have have been different so i don't like to get too hung up on this is my property this can't change these things can it gives the property idea gives an idea some things are pretty permanent what are those things when i feel in balance what are what are my gifts what are what what, what did i come in with um are they tend to be more vata pitta or kapha you know i will say in my own life i had three different excellent ex very experienced ayurvedic practitioners give me three different prakriti readings by the time i was 25. so um there was something of value in each one of those that I got that I resonated with and that I've seen. Yes, this has been a, this this aspect of what they were seeing has been pretty stable in my life. Um, I don't think it's a good idea to get too attached, certainly to your idea, our idea, my idea of property or somebody else's idea of what my property is until um, until I know what my constitution is. And I might be in my 50s before I feel confident. I'm like, yeah, no, I know this is what my body is, tends to do, right? Um, I think it's a good idea not, certainly, to get too attached to, oh, yes, my numbers are 132 or 321 or 123 or whatever, you know, Vata predominant, Pitta secondary. But, you, sometimes it's very clear, you know, and there's not much, but sometimes it's not so clear and we could get it wrong and then coalesce around an idea, try to identify, you know, wrap our identity around something that like it's not even reality, it's a model of reality. So be fluid with that. I think what is more useful is and easier for certainly a beginning to intermediate sometimes to advance the student or practitioner of Ayurveda, it's easier to and more practical in some ways to, to, to pinpoint what the Vikriti is. What's the current condition? What's out of whack? That's pretty easy to say, okay, there's anxiety. That's a lot of thing, you know, and bring it back. It's as simple as that. And not to get too complicated even with that, 
if that's confusing and all three doshas are kind of, you're like not sure what's pushing what and what's going on, go to the gunas. The gunas, there's not three, there's two. There's grounding, nourishing gunas and there's stimulating, motivating gunas. And there's 10 of each. You go to those and increase our self-awareness about which one is active at any moment, which one is overactive, which one is over, mm, uh, over present, which one is under present and tame or nourish accordingly. That makes it really simple and it keeps it like, okay, what am I feeling? Like go inside and forget the gunas, the names of the gunas, go inside again, <laughs> Turn that awareness inside and say, what am I feeling and where? How can I describe it with qualities? And I can use opposite qualities to that to bring it back into balance. I love how these conversations always have a common theme. And somehow the questions always seem so different when I write them. But yet you just like bundle them up like a beautiful book and a bow on top. And really, it's just coming back to our essence, embodying it, checking in with body first. And we have all these different references that are great, but we can't take them as the end all be all. That is the last the last call. Like our bodies are, are the call and how we interact and use these resources. It's truly what the answer yeah. is. and just to end on more of a fun note i i'm curious you know you mentioned meditation is something that you tap into to tune into the divine essence and i also love that there's so many quote-unquote non-spiritual practices that we can use to tune into the divine essence in ways that really surprise us and i'm curious if you have any of those that are maybe not so rigid like in your practice but just kind of embodied in your life that help you to tune into the divine Yeah, well, first, I want to go back to something that you said, it all comes down to listening to the body or, or attending to the body. And by body and by listening to the self, I don't mean just the physical body, like, oh, my elbow hurts, my stomach hurts, oh, my back hurts. It's not just the body. The body is one kosha, the anamaya kosha, right, made of physical muscles and tissues and all of this kind of stuff. The pranamaya kosha, is the energy body and that includes those tissues and extends out and then the manomaya kosha which are the only three of the five or more that that you know that i want to talk about here but the manomaya kosha goes anywhere in there so when when i'm turning my attention into the quote body it's to the to the through the it's not so much the muscles and the organs and the tissues, although I might feel something in the muscles and the organs and the tissues, but going to that place where I'm feeling that thing in the tissues and connecting to the prana experience at that point. So is the prana, is the energy there constricted? Is it stuck? Is it black? Is it empty? Breathing into that and letting that obstruction that stickiness that emptiness resolve and dissolve and so that's kind of more than the body it's like going inside to the different layers and then so i would say if there's a spiritual practice you know i'm i my guru was very clear with me never to give spiritual practices so but I would say in terms of like connecting with the divine, going into those subtler levels from the physical, you know, okay, I identify there's a physical sensation somewhere in my body. Let me imagine that to be an energetic sensation within the energetic body. Let me go into the essence of that. Let me resolve and dissolve that. That tends to release the obstruction to smooth flow of prana. Smooth pro flow of prana ends up having a sattvic promoting, sattva promoting effect on the mind, that sattva being that clarity, right? That's not spiritual enlightenment. That's not the be all and the end all. That's just a means to the end. However, that means is very pleasant right and it is does seem to be a prerequisite prerequisite 
to some kind of spiritual practice being um, easier to practice, more su successful in air quotes to practice, more fruitful to practice. So um, forget about spiritual practices, the, the prerequisites to spiritual practices themselves can feel divine and can feel like an invitation to the divine. And so that's something that I can practice every day. So, uh, you know, I can walk into a room, feel some kind of presence uh, or situation or activity or relationship or sentence from somebody that I respond to by clenching, you know, by tightening up, by feeling anxious or something. And so that moment, at that moment, nobody knows, has to know what I'm doing. I don't, not, don't, not holding up a placard. I'm not teaching it. I'm not saying, hey, I need a timeout. I'm going to practice this. I'm just doing it in the middle of Thanksgiving, in the middle of a holiday with family, in the middle of whatever, whatever is going on, taking a moment and turning my awareness inside, bringing it to wherever that sensation is <clears throat> and releasing that, breathing into it, giving it space. dissolving and resolving my resistance to reality, whatever it, that is at that moment. And that just, that to me feels like an invitation to the divine. And that feels like something I can practice anytime, anywhere with my eyes open or closed. Nobody has to know that I'm doing it, but it's part of my spiritual practice. Mm. Wow. That is so powerful. And I'm, I'm so grateful that you walked our community through that so they can practice that in real time and feel that. And I simply love that practice because it's so true. You, we can get triggered all the time in our, in our daily lives. And I talk about this all the time, how uh, for me, it's just bringing the awareness of in the moment when I do, it's more so I have a self-reflection practice after to say, hey, that really did cause something in me. Um, and so it's so inspiring to know that you have like a real time practice and, and what that looks like, that practicality behind that is, is super beautiful. Thanks, Angelica. I always just, I love your questions. Thank you so much for your, um, for your dedication to, to um, truth so far as we can touch it. <laughs> Thank you. I, these conversations are so nourishing to the soul and I love just getting to expand and talk about uh, the microcosm, the macrocosm, it just, it's always enlightening. And I'm, I'm really grateful for your time and your teachings and, and all the beautiful work that you do in our world. Thank you. Oh, and one last question that I want to ask you, Dr. Claudia Welch. Um, do you have any courses or anything coming out that our community can connect with you on? Yes. Uh, and I, I would just love everybody to come here. I, I, there's this there's a project that uh, seven other people and I have been working on for a few years. It's called satsangam.net, S-A-T, which means truth, sangam, which means confluence, um, S -A, so S-A-T-S-A-N-G-A-M.net, not .com, but .net, because we're all connected, right? <laughs> so satsangam.net. Um, and in that, you might really enjoy exploring the life map. Go to there and, and explore the life map, which looks at Ayurveda and yoga and Sanskrit and dance, looks at how everything, all these Indian sciences and arts are connected and how they're inspired by various um, Indian teachers, texts and traditions. One of the things I think we've been doing as Western or non-Indian um, students of Vedic sciences and arts is we've been picking one that we want to learn or two. Oh, yeah, I want to learn Ayurveda. I want to learn yoga. I want to learn Ayurveda and yoga. And, and so we're learning an Eastern science in this very Western way, focusing on that thing that we're learning without understanding the context in which they exist. Mm. And it's not that we're evil. 
are, you know, it's that we don't know. We really are so ignorant about what we talk about, what the sister sciences are, but we don't even really know what they are. Yoga and Ayurveda are not sister sciences to speak, to speak of. Yo Ayurveda is considered a science. Yoga is considered a darshana, a philosophy, and they are connected through all these different threads and connections in um, in the Vedic knowledge systems. So it it helps orient us to what what our field is, what our subject is, in the context of all of these other Vedic knowledge systems. And my um, friend and colleague, Dr. Ram Kumarji, and I plan to co-facilitate a course starting October 5th. Um, so in less than a month from now, October uh, 5th, 2022, called Vedic Threads. And so in this course, it'll be a membership-based course. We'll meet twice a month for an hour and a half is the idea. And we'll take different topics from so we'll take like a an idea or a topic or a thread and we'll say let's say it's prana versus shakti what's the difference they're both translated as energy a lot of the time what are the differences between prana versus shakti and like for example we'll it will have these two guest instructors dr robert svoboda and carolina prada one is a, a ayurvedic physician one is an a traditional Odissi dance performer and Kalari Payet uh, uh, practitioner, which is a martial art in Southern India. And they're going to be talking about the role of prana versus Shakti in Ayurveda versus dance and martial art, etc. So we start seeing, for example, if we look at prana and Shakti in Ayurveda, we have these particular ideas of what they are in Ayurveda. But when we see how somebody uses those ideas and practices those ideas and embodies those ideas in dance or in Kaladi Payat, the, um, how, how does that will have no alternative but to broaden our understanding of what these ideas mean. So I'm really excited about that course and I don't use the word excited often. Wow, I'm so excited for that course as well. I think that is so, so great for continuing education. And I think that's so needed because we see such a segmentation, you know, this polarity world where we're constantly separating things, even in the yoga tradition, if you look on that micro level of mantra and then the poses and then the breath and really it's like, how does this all come together? And I love that you're dipping into other cultures as well. That sounds like a beautiful offering and I'll be sure to um, link that in the show notes so that everyone can get to know that community even more. Wonderful. You're you're it's a new community and and I'm um I, I'm I'm really excited about it. It's been a vision that we've all been coalescing around for a while. So it'll be great to have um our communities merge. So that'll be lovely. Thanks so much. And maybe before we um, sign off, maybe everybody could do this with us. Maybe we could just take 15 seconds of quiet just to absorb. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Claudia Welch. And thank you to all of our listeners for being here. Um, I will see you next time on the next episode.